Every man faces death. Lord knows I've faced it many times. I took lead at Anzio. I was napalmed in Korea. And boy, that little filly in Perry put an awful strain on my ticker, I tell you what. Welcome to the Dreams of Consciousness podcast. If you would be so kind, would you mind introducing yourselves? Oh, I'm Luca Indrio from uh, the band Necra. 
And I'm Chad Gailey. I play drums in Necrot. And how would you describe the music of Necrot? Death metal, primal. How do you say? Like the, um, it refers to, it's like close to like old school death metal or classics. Death metal classic mm, revival. <laughs> or or, just, or just, <laughs> just death metal. That's death it. metal. There you go. That's easier. That's it. <laughs> if anybody like you know, but if anybody who's listening has no idea who we are, we sound more like a ball thrower than than we sound like five finger uh, punch. What the fuck that? So a modern death metal band with more of a traditional approach. There you go. Thank yeah. you, man. What would we do without you? <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> and if I'm not mis- mistaken, you guys are both in Vastum as well, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I spoke to Layla from Vastum for episode 106. I was about to ask you, with the name of your podcast, I imagine you're a Vastum fan. (laughs) Uh, I do like Vastum. (laughs) Chad, you also are in Mortuous and you run Carbonized Records. Yes. Yes, that is correct. And you guys were also, I don't know if you're still both in the band Acephalix? I am. Okay. I was. Yeah, that, uh, I still yeah Luke, Luke is a nice acephalic. So I think between Necrot, Mortuous, Acephalix, and Vastum, we have a lot of bands that could be described as old school death metal or you know traditional death metal, except maybe Vastum is getting a little bit more avant-garde and experimental. But it, how would you describe the difference between Necrot and Experimental? A little bit. That last album was uh, a little bit experimental. Yeah. Is that when I when I think about experimental, I think about like you know, Phantomas or Mr. Bungo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's fair. I mean, I, I was thinking more of like um, <laughs> Demolic or you know something like that, where it's you know. Sure. Yeah. Like technical. Yeah, I mean, what would you say the differences between Necrot and the other bands that you guys play in? Well, I think I think there is like a, a big difference between Necro and Acephalix, just because of uh, since we became one guitar with Acephalix, we started using the HM2 pedal for a few, couple of albums, and the songs are just like the tones are so much different because like Necro is such a like a Marshall amplifiers classic tones kind of like approach. Well, Acephalix and Vastum, to me, it sounds more modern, in a sense. Because it's more like, you know, uh, Mesa Boogies, triple rectifiers, HM2 pedal on some of the Acephalix stuff. It's definitely more of a modern sound, if, if, you, know, uh, if you know these amplifiers. <laughs> <laughs> like, with, 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 with Necro, we use a, a lot of old stuff. Like, my bass is from 78, and I use, like, a Sun head. And Sony plays through a JMP Marshall and a JCM 800, which they're all old amplifiers, and he's playing through a Les Paul. So it's like the approach of Necrod is very much almost like Motorhead, Black Sabbath sound. You know, translated into down tune death metal, of course, you know. Well, Vastum and Acephalix is more of like a mid tempo chugginess. While Necrod is a little bit faster and a little bit more variegated, I guess, compared to maybe Acephalix. So th- these are the differences I, I, can, I can tell you, Chad. I mean, with Mortuous, I think it's very uh, early, early to mid-90s Death Doom sound. So, I mean, they're going for, like, you know, the sound of like Paradise Lost and Incantation and My Dying Bride and Rotrevor. So, I mean, I don't know, like w- with the with the amps or with the sound that the other guys are going for, they they kind of, you know, they vary. Like Colin, I know he's used a Marshall head at some points, and then he also has used an Ampeg head that he got from Daryl from Funebrarm. I guess Clint uses like a, a sun. I think he's used a sun head. I don't. I got you know. It's hard. It's hard for me to remember these things just because I'm. I play drums, so I'm. You know, I'm trying to remember from memory. And then uh, Mike. Mike kind of. 
I, Mike likes the more know, digital like, sound, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. The, like the you know late '90s, early 2000s, like kind of technical, super compressed. Yeah, but it sounds sick, you know, and you get it all dialed in. Balanced it out with calling sound too. Yeah, oh, it's nice it to works. have. It's nice to have the the balance between them, especially on the recording. Would you say there's a, a difference in the approach to songwriting? Definitely. Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I go for about the Mortuous. I have no idea what you guys do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like with Mortuous, it's Vaughn and Mike write most of the songs, and I mean, it, yeah, like you know, with Mortuous, it's very Death Doom focused compared to like Necrot is kind of you know straightforward, more punk thrash influence. Uh, you know, Necrot. You know, the lyrics are very Doom Doom themed, but I guess as far as the music is concerned, it's very like. It's very uh, straightforward, and I don't, I don't know. I think it's very, uh, yeah, like Luca said earlier, it's very like traditional, very primitive sounding. Let's talk about the the history of the band a little bit. You know, with you guys having been in and also afterwards playing in other death metal bands, what was it that that led to Necrot forming, and what were your intentions with the band? The way that Necrot started was. I was playing in a band called Bruxers and we were we were around for a few years and we just you know we were playing a lot of local shows but uh I don't know we hadn't really like played you know bigger shows and then we had the chance to hop on a show last minute with Luca's band Ace of Alex, and that's when we all met them and it was really cool because we liked Ace of Alex a lot and and then we got to do a show and meet them, and they were stoked on us. So it was like it was cool getting to make that happen. And then Luca and and Kyle were starting Necrop, but um, before that, they'd asked me to to try out for Ace of Alex to see if I could cover Dave for their European tour. And I didn't make that um, audition, but um, I got to try out for Necrop a couple weeks later, and. And uh, you know, after kind of jamming together on a couple songs, it was it was pretty much set that you know they wanted to continue jamming. So um, yeah, I mean, the reason why we, me and Kyle were like, oh, let's start another band, was because we wanted to play with you. <laughs> so you were gonna pass <laughs> that. <laughs> you, you, oh, perfect. You were, <laughs> you were ready, you know. And then the, the um, but that was such a weird time because it's like. He came and practiced with us for the Euro tour that was going to happen like a few months after. And then he, uh, we decided to go with a more experienced drummer. You know, Chad was really young at the time. And, and uh, not because Chad wasn't good, because Chad was great. So me and Kyle were like, okay, let's, let's, let's keep playing with this guy. But then like literally like not much more than a month after, Kyle ended up playing on the Euro tour last minute. So then we had to replace Kyle to uh, the guitar to make the tour happen. And at that point, me and Chad were like, or, you know, even just me, but both of us, we were like, okay, we don't want to play with Kyle because we were starting Necro to do a band that could go on tour and do everything that needs to be done. So it's like, we cannot start the band with someone who's already flaking on his other main band. So at that point, we, I talked with Kyle, I was like, dude, we can't play. And this, you know, one band with you is enough. Let, let me have my own thing that is not going to, you know, get screwed over by, you know, you not wanting to do shit. So it was like, <laughs> pretty much. So then Kyle was like very understanding. You know, me and Kyle are really good friends. And Kyle was like, yeah, of course, you know, he understood. He was like, yeah, dude, do your thing. And like, you know, keep playing with Chad and find another guitar player. And me and Chad were like, you know, we don't want to find anybody until we know it's going to be someone who's going to fucking make this his life too because me and Chad wanted to do that. So then we waited until, you know, things happened with Sonny. The, the time we was playing with Saviors and... He was really busy, but then his band moved to L.A., and all of a sudden he didn't have much to do. So we gave him the tapes, and, like, you know, we knew that Sonny was a touring machine because he has been touring most of his life, and we know he was the sick guitar player. So we gave him our first tape, or the first two, actually, and he liked it, and then the rest is history. <laughs> our, our, our history. <laughs> <laughs> So if I understand what you're saying, it wasn't specifically uh, the type of music that led to Necrot forming. You guys just wanted to be in an active touring band. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, to me, it was like I also wanted a band where I could dictate uh, the sound, where I could be like, okay, this is what, because this is like, you know, I, always, I joined Acephalix and Kyle was writing most of the songs and I started helping, helping him write, but overall it was like, you know, at one point I just gave up. I was like, you should do it, man, because it was exactly his sound, his style, you know what I mean? So I took a step back. And then I was writing songs for Vastum, but at the same time in Vastum we all write songs. So it was like, you know, I wrote some song, Leila wrote some song, Kyle wrote some song. I, I wanted something that he was like fully what I wanted to do because for me both AC Felix and Vastum, they were too, sl too slow. They, 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 they were not fully what I wanted to do for as much as I love them and I like the music we recorded and, and what we do is like, you know what I mean? It was never fully what like my full expression would have been, you know? And then Necro came to be also because of that necessity. On top of the necessity of having a band where I'm the singer so that, you know, I'm not going to get screwed over by a singer that eventually, you know, you put a lot of work in a band, you get to do, to do things. This has happened to me a lot of times before forming Necra, you know what I mean? To get to, like, points, put a lot of work, you finally get offered a tour, you do one, you get offered another, everybody takes a step back. And I'm the only one being like, why, guys? You know what I mean? So Necro was like... Do it or fucking die. You know what I mean? Come in the band. You, you know, for real. It's like, if you don't want to do it, you go fuck yourself. Me and Chag, you know what I mean? It's like, we're going to do it. And then we found Sonny that is like, he wants to do everything too. So it's like, perfect. You know, we don't have that problem anymore. Now, is that also the reason why you guys stayed as a three piece? Because I imagine it's, it's easier to keep a band together when it's just, when there's fewer members. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Sonny already can handle, like, covering, you know, uh, two guitars on his own because it's just, you know, he's so experienced with, you know, doing sound for so long and just playing. He, you know, he knows how to effectively command control of the sound just with only having one guitar. And, and we didn't need to get a, a second guitarist, even though, We've had tons of people offer and, you know, hit us up about joining. It's just, it's always just been, Sonny can, Sonny can already handle it, so we're good.
your second album, Mortal, is set to be released on August 28th. Tell me a little bit about the album. Uh, well, it's the second full length. I don't know. We uh, <laughs> we spent a lot of time getting prepared to record and and get this one going. We've been touring for the last three years, so it was kind of difficult to find the time for us to to set aside for us to get in there and and start learning all these songs. But I don't know. I think it's definitely a, a darker album. It's a very it's a it's a more proficient album across the board just you know from all of our playing we're definitely more confident and we just you know a lot more tight with all the songs I think you know also Greg Wilkinson who recorded it he you know he's he's definitely made it sound as best as it can be he's always done such a great job with all of our recordings that he's he's done for us and then we uh, went with Alan Duchet to master the album and we had never we had never gone with him before it was a recommendation on greg who'd worked with him previously on a few albums so we're we're, you know very open but also very uh, committed to the idea that we had when we uh decided to go in and do this record yeah i think greg also like you know as you say like in these three years we got so much better from from playing hundreds of shows and i think Mm -hmm. that also greg got better from recording a lot of bands, hundreds you know, of you know, bands, <laughs> thousands, thousands. Yeah. <laughs> well, like you know, in those three years, also Greg developed new, you know, strategies and little tricks, and he's got some new material, some new equipment, and he's got like you know, some new way of doing something that is more efficient and and time saving. But like for us, is like the way I see it is like we switched from being in these three years, we switched from a band that wanted to be a real band to a real band that's got to do everything in a short amount of time because time two, three months, you got to go back on tour again. And there is no breaks. So there is no talking about, oh, let's take six months off to write the record. Let's take a year off to write and record the record. You know what I mean? We can't do that anymore. I mean, now everything changed. But like, you know, at that time we were like, we can't because we are going to have to write this record in between tours. And I'm going to, I wrote the lyrics on tour during our 45 uh, days with Exhumed and Gay Creeper. When we got back, it's, it's like, we, we played three months straight of shows. We, we wrote the album and, and practiced it in between like four months. And then we, hit, then we went on tour for almost three months nonstop. Then we got back and we literally had like three weeks to practice. Every, we took a week off and then, or, or 10 days off. And then we started practicing every day for three weeks. And then we went on the studio every single day until the album was finished. So it's like, it's all like back to back, back to back, back to back. So it's what you, that's what you're doing all the time, all the time. Always playing music, always doing it. Always playing with these two guys. You know what I mean? We're always playing together everywhere. So then you get into the studio and you're like, you know exactly what you're doing because you never stop. So with that in mind and with the added pressure of your tour commitments and your other band commitments, would you say that you guys are Right, you guys write songs faster. Did these songs come together faster than your previous album? I think yeah, they came they came faster definitely. Yeah, I think I got better at writing songs without overthinking it too much. Again, it's shit done. You know what I mean? I gotta write songs. I know that I know how to do it. I'm gonna sit there and do it and get it done. Boom. That's that's the approach. Before it was like, oh, this song sounds sick, but maybe I don't know. Maybe I'll listen to it again. We'll try again in a month, see if we still like it. Like, you know, good night. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I think there was a lot more of overthinking on my side, at least, when I was writing songs. Like, initially, it was, like, brutal. Like, the time, like, I, I, was, I would write so many riffs, and then, like, most of them are, are lost forever. Or, like, even for Blood Offerings, I wrote an amount of lyrics for Blood Offerings that it would be, like, a, a whole discography of some other band. <laughs> you know, it's like overthinking, like, you know, I'm going to redo it, I'm going to make it better, I'm going to do it again, I'm going to re- rewrite the lyrics again. You know what I mean? It's like mental almost. Now there is, I'm, I'm a little, <laughs> now I'm a little more, you know, focused and I know that, what I like, I know what I'm doing. I, I'm just more confident and I don't need to, like, it's easier to write an album now, definitely. Would you say that the limited time was beneficial in terms of your songwriting? Yeah, I think it's just like, you know, 
I think he's, I said this in another interview too, but like I think he's the right amount of pressure and the right amount of confidence together. And we had like, you know, we had, we had that confidence from playing so many shows. After Blood Offering came out, we never stopped. And we were playing a lot of shows before too, but especially after Blood Offering came out, we did a lot of tours. So it's like uh, that confidence and also the pressure of like, you know, we, need, we wanted the album to be out in June. And we wanted to do all those tours. We didn't want to skip any of it. So it's like, this is the time for us to make it happen. And it was somewhat stressful because we had a, you know, we had a moment that I, I was definitely, I don't know, squeezing Chad and Sonny a little hard. <laughs> or, you know, uh, I had, like, you know, there was a moment of a little bit of, like, pressure that came out from it. You know what I mean? That I was, like, you know, making sure that Sonny was... was was, was catching up and writing the solos, you know, because it's like, I write the riffs, but then it's like, you know, I need Chad to help me with, with, with the fucking uh, drum beats, of course, you know what I mean? And then I need, I need Sonny to write the solos, and then we need to practice them, and then it's like, you know what I mean? It's like, there is some parts that is, is in my control, that is the lyrics, and is the, uh, the rhythm guitars, the riffs, but then we needed all to really put this amount of work into it, and like, unfortunately, Sonny was going through some yet to move twice you know what i mean in the middle of like these four months that we had to write and learn the record sony had a bunch of shit that happened to him so it's like me and chad were getting ahead kind of like and he was getting a little left behind because like me and chad were like had, had way more time than him and he was having a hard time uh, i don't know yet to move twice or he had to work a lot in that period because he needed the money to make those moves that he was he had to do you know what i mean so it's like there was a little bit of stress given from the from the um, from the short amount of time that we had to put this album together. But at the same time, even that kind of stress, I think that ultimately pushed each and one of us to get the best out of our capacities, our our skills. You know, I think it really helped because pressure can help do the, get the best result. Is is always like that. I believe in that. That's why I think to do great things, you need to be able to handle pressure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what can you tell me about the lyrical themes? Well, lyrically, it's like we talk, it's, it's kind of like, we, we, it's, it's somewhat, we, we talk about like, you know, the, the way society and is and affects everybody and the way this world is very based on injustice and suffering of a lot of people, of everybody. And we also talk about like mortality and the condition of man of being a mortal being, not only at the end of his life, but through, through, through our whole life, you know, that we constantly like lose things that we think they were going to be there forever or whatever, you know, people has got these illusions. And uh, in a way, it's like we talk about mortality in a way of like acceptance, in a way of like uh, accept the fact that you're going to lose everything so... You don't have to lose your mind. You don't have to get so mad when things don't go the way you want it. You know, and you can find comfort in that, you know, in that darkness, in knowing that you're going to die, in knowing that everything is going to disappear and be forgotten one day. So it's like, don't get so fucking caught up on this life on a, on a, sim, on a simple level, you know? It's like things are never as obvious as, as they really look. Do you draw most of your lyrics from real life and real experiences? Yeah, definitely. I, I try actually, when I'm writing an album, I try to not get, and like usually I try not to read books, I try not to listen to too much music. I, I try to get the least as possible influenced by anything. So as you mentioned, the album was recorded by Greg Wilkinson. Wilkinson has worked with a lot of, maybe most of the, the extreme metal bands in the area, and he also recorded your previous album. Tell me about working with Greg and your relationship with him. I mean, we've we've known Greg for years. He's played in a ton of bands in the Bay Area, and he's recorded a ton of bands in the Bay Area. And you know, it's just it's it's good to have you know, it's good to work with people that you've known for a long time and you you're friends with, just because you know you know how to I guess like navigate. And, you know, there's no, it's not awkward. It's just, you know, it's, it's kind of like you're hanging out almost, but, you know, you're still working. You're still getting stuff done, but it's, it's you know, nobody's, nobody's in some weird attitude. You can't, you know, you can't read somebody, you know, the wrong way. It's like, you know, it's all, it's all just 
friendly, and and so that's why we like working with them. I mean, with with the last album, I think he did a great job as you know as best that he could do with you know what we gave him, and I I think like you know he just totally stepped it up for this new album, and he helped us you know. He helped give us ideas on on how certain song structures should go, or just, you know, if if somebody should redo a take or redo a part to make it better. You know, he's always he's always there to help, but he's also there to just you know make sure that it it gets captured as best as possible. And and so that's you know that's a, a great reason why we work with him is just because we trust him, and you know we don't want to work with people that we don't trust and we're not friends with. So. <laughs> well, there is a great power that I think comes from working with people that you really love and appreciate. It because it's like we've known Greg for at least ten years, and we've known Scotty for at least uh, Sony probably known Scotty for like twenty five years. He's like all these people, like you know, we 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 really are family, and it's like we all want us to succeed. We want to do good with the record so that Scotty can do good with his label and Greg can do good with his studio and like and Maral can do good or whatever. And then Maral wants to do a great cover so that we do good and then Scotty do good. And Scotty want like, you know, I mean, everybody wants the best for, for each other. So it's like it's we're, all all, put, we're all putting the best effort. You know what I mean? You get that? We're all putting the best effort, not just for yourself. We're all trying to help each other. Also because we're not like, you know, Oakland's got a great sense of community. It's, it's always been like kind of like a rough place where to live in. And like, you really feel really close to these people that share with you, like, you know, uh, your life shows. And it, it, I think it's great to, to continue working with, for us, it's great to continue working with, this, with these people that they're family to us.
you guys are actually in the studio fairly recently, right? You recorded this earlier in the year, January, February. Yeah, we yeah, were we in started, there for a month. Yeah, we started at the end of January. So this album sounds like it came together pretty fast. It did, definitely. It's true, because I think I started writing the first song for it. It was probably April. When did we get back from that Decibel tour? Uh, we got March. back in middle of March. Middle of March. Okay, so yeah, yeah, usually when we get back from a tour, we take 10 days, two weeks. That you, don't, you don't even want to think about anything. So I think the beginning of April, really, and then it was done. Maybe beginning, but we did something else after that Decibel or not. Well, we we, 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 went, we went to Canada. To, uh, Canada, and I think, I mean, we, uh, didn't we, I don't know. It's, there it's was kind some of other escaping things me in right the now. But yeah, for I, I mean, we, 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 I mean, we played some shows in the Bay Area. We went to Canada, and, and after that, we went to the Pacific Northwest and did a, a run of shows there, and then we went to Australia and Japan before the other tour with Exhumed. So it's like... You know, in between the big tours, we were just focusing on practicing and writing the new songs. Uh, yeah, I would say from, sum, sum, from summer in April until mid-August, because then at the end of August, me and Chad had to leave to Europe to play Kill Town with Bastum. Yeah. So, yeah, that was the time to write and learn everything. Then we were gone for three months not playing those songs, and then we got back and started playing them again for three weeks straight before hitting the studio. But, you know, coming back from uh, three months of tours, so we, we were so tight and we were practicing every day going into recording more. That gives you a great advantage. You know, you're so warmed up. <laughs> you're, you're burning. <laughs> you're on fire. <laughs> <laughs> so back to Greg. You mentioned the community of musicians around the area. I said this in the past, I don't know if you, if you have any thoughts on this, but I compared Greg to Scott Burns back in the day, his relationship to the Florida scene. Um, would you say that Greg is the Scott Burns of the barrier scene? I mean, yeah, now. I mean, it, it, the thing is, it's like, Greg doesn't, Greg doesn't do just death metal. He records like all types of bands, all types of projects in the Bay Area. And, you know, so it's like, you know, he's got, He's got bands and artists coming from all over the world to record at his studio at Earhammer and so it's it's like it's world famous but it's all I think he could be considered Scott Burns for like the death metal aspect but I mean he just he's just overall a really great engineer and producer and and he does a great job with with every recording and he, he's a Grammy winner now right yeah, he won a Grammy with the High on Fire album that he recorded. He recorded, uh, he helped recording. I think it was like, you know, High on Fire records through different studios, depending. Oh, okay. On. I think he, rec like, you know, High on Fire eventually will do the drums somewhere and then the guitars with Greg. I don't remember exactly what he did for, for the record. He did some, some of the tracking for sure. Yeah, least. I mean, well, the thing is, like, Greg, yeah, Greg and Alan, the the people who worked on our new album, they both won Grammys for that High on Fire album. So technically, we're we're gonna win a Grammy this year. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Uh, thank me in your speech, man. You 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 got the the, the, the perfect radio voice, man. You, you you're doing it right. I love it. This is very re relaxing. Yeah, I'm I'm like the uh, the Terry Gross of death metal. Uh, we we appreciate it. <laughs> Uh, tell me about uh, about Tank Crimes. They'll be releasing Mortal. Well, that was no brainer for us, really. Scotty came to my house. He, well, I told him, I was like, let's talk about the next album, you know. And Scotty came to my house. I told him what we wanted. He said, okay. And then we smoked a joint. <laughs> <laughs> Easy. <Yeah. laughs> Scotty released our demo compilation LP back in 2016, and, and he's done every every vinyl and CD and tape almost since uh, since then. So, I mean, we, we wanted to go with, with him just because it's like we've, we're, we've been working with him for so long. And also it's just, it's a local a local Bay Area label. And, you know, we, we want to definitely keep keep the uh, support within the Bay. And, and I mean, he, he, you know, he's done a great job so far. And, I mean, like Luca said, he's family, so we want to continue to keep it in the family. 
We keep it in the family. We're like a mafia, man. Yeah. <laughs> Death metal mafia. <laughs> it's traditional. <laughs> We're old school. We're old school. Yeah. <laughs> Ten Crimes is an interesting label because they're not specifically a death metal label but they release a lot of death metal bands how would you say you relate to the other bands on the label well to me it's like i never give a shit about what other bands are on the label never cared i never chose a label because there's bands that i like on it that to me doesn't make any sense because it's like you have to you have to choose the label by the the work they do, what they offer you, the way they are, the person that you're working with, because it's someone you're gonna have to trust and be in a business relationship too, you know? So it's like, to me, it doesn't matter what bands you put out, if you're gonna put the back work, you know, to support my band and promote it and give us what we want. And and so it's like, to me, it's like, there is no problem, whatever else Scotty wants to put out, I don't really care too much. I'm, I'm happy that if he does, put something out and it does good but like I, 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 we, we never chose a, lab, a label because of the bands on it. In terms of their business philosophy, Tank Crime seems to, to come more from the DIY punk rock uh, mindset. Uh, was that appealing to you at all? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for us it's like, you know, Scott knew that he, to work with us, he had to let us handle a lot. Like he could not just come in and be like, okay, now you guys are going to do this or that. Like, you know, we still we still produce ourselves, like in the sense that we pay for the recording, we own our own music, we pay the artists that we work with, and Time Crimes helps us promote the album and put it out as a record label, giving us like an incredibly great deal, you know what I mean? So it's like, it's kind of like a, a DIY collaboration <laughs> with Time Crimes, because it's, we still are in control of, of, of our band and our music and our direction and like everything that we do. Well, you know, it's not, it's, not, it's not that obvious. It's not that obvious with other labels. And it's like, also, it's like Scott is someone that is like fully transparent with us, you know, that you, he, he shows us everything. He's like, do you guys want to know whatever? Here's the books, here's the Spotify, here's this, here's this. Like, you know, it's completely like available always. It's like it's someone we can trust is never going to screw us over. He never... Um, He's just a great person. He knows. He has. He used to be a drummer of a band. Like he has been in the scene since forever. He started by pressing pins at punk shows and selling them, and then he made some tapes. Like you know, it's like he truly like came from the underground, like like we did. It's like it's great for us to work with us because we understand each other on the same level, and he understands that we need our our freedom, and we know that we're always gonna like you know do good and put the work in to like, you know, go on tour and promote the album. We will always guarantee him that. And it's like, uh, he can guarantee us like, you know, the things that we ask him to work with us, he can do that for us. Very cool. I'd like to talk about the Bay Area scene a little bit. I'm in my 40s. And so, you know, I, I grew up, if somebody said metal from the Bay Area or, or music from the Bay Area, I had a, a very specific sound in mind. Which was the uh, the thrash metal scene? The mamas and papas. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, and and all that and all that stuff. And there was a big uh, hardcore scene as well. But I I never really thought of the Barry as being a place where death and black metal bands came from. It's only been in the last like maybe decade that I started hearing about, you know, obviously like Vastum, Acephalix, Necrot. San Jose, well, he p possessed. Yeah, they're from San Francisco. Yeah, and San Jose is at least in the Bay Area. We we still consider it the Bay Area, and there is a lot of bands from San Jose too. Chad can name you like seventy-five thousand. Yeah, <laughs> definitely five thousand. Are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's there's like now there's been like I think in the last like ten or fifteen years there's been a lot of death metal, black metal, doom, sludge bands that are like have been forming in the Bay Area and that are like, you know, recognized internationally. And I think, you know, people when they hear of like a band coming from Oakland, they just, you know, oh, they know it's going to be, you know, probably good or probably decent just because of, you know, all the other bands that they've heard that have come from Oakland and people like to come to Oakland because they think like, oh yeah, you know, it's like, 
it's a huge like underground music mecca in the bay like in California at least you know it's like you know our it's it's like LA and then there's Oakland there's like you know those are the two places in California that you know metal is happening but I think you know more so it's it's more of a community and more I think more people are helping each other out in the bay compared to anywhere else in, in California so yeah I mean it, the bay area it's it's so massive just because there's like you know there's a greater bay area and then there's you know San Francisco Oakland so there's like you know there's a ton of bands around and everybody has to like travel to get to the spots unless they're in the town that the shows are at or where the bands are. So, yeah, I think definitely there's been, like, more of a resurgence, though, of, like, death metal, black metal type stuff. And, I mean, and, and also Oakland and the Bay Area has had, you know, a thriving punk underground culture since since the 70s. So I think, you know, if you're trying to look for... Strong, like a strong, a strong area where music is. I, I definitely consider the Bay Area one of those places. What would you say led to led to the scene, or specifically the death and black metal scene, blossoming the way it has? I, I know a lot of people say Ludacro was the kind of the inciting band that led to a lot of other bands forming. Yeah, I mean Ludacro was a. They were around for a really long time. I mean, they they definitely all spawned off on other bands after that. But I mean, I don't know. Like, there's that there's was too early that. for me and Chad, kind of right. No, I mean, when did they I start mean, I was, playing? I saw I was them just, a few times, but I was just starting to really get into Ludacra when they stopped. When, well, yeah, pretty much. They were on, they were almost done playing by the time like I was getting into them, but. I mean, before then, you had bands like Asunder, and I think Graves at Sea was up in Oakland for a little True. bit. Uh, you had Lot in them, like a lot of the like. You, the, you had that crusty uh, doom. Yeah, Storm Crow, like a lot of True. the like the like the crusty doomy metal band, like sludgy metal bands. They're kind of like what led to a lot of more, you know, a lot more bands forming and and playing shows around the Bay Area. So I think I think you'd have to look, like, you know, about 10 or 15 years, maybe even 20 years earlier to find out how, how those bands influenced all the bands coming later. Because, like, all the people that were watching those bands still go to shows, and they have their own bands now too. And so it's just, you know, it's, it's just passing the torch almost. But yeah, I, I think, think, I think, I think maybe Dystopia, man. Dystopia had a lot of influence on a lot of those bands, I think, like Stormcrow of, of Great Sea, that they, that they had that, like, that crusty, fucked up side, kind of. Yeah, I mean, they, they were in Oakland for a little bit, but they started in Southern California. True. I think, yeah, I think they moved up later on. I mean, two of them still live in the Bay Area, so Amaz and Dino, so... But yeah, I mean, as far as like death metal is concerned, like you know, all the death metal bands kind of started forming around 2009, 2000, or maybe you know, maybe even earlier, because like Ace of Alex was definitely the first one that I knew of when I was like, like I mean, when Brexit was playing, we were like, yeah, Ace of Alex, Vastum, and I'm trying to think who else. But those were like the big bands for us. Like we we're like, oh yeah, they're sick. Like we like those bands, and because we, we were also playing death metal and like crust, so that was like it was cool to like you know see other bands doing that. And I think you know then you had like Mortuous started in 2009, Skull X started around 2000, I think 2008 or 2009 or 10, and those were and then Necrot started in 2011, and then. You've had other bands since then start, but yeah, I, I, I want to say like Ace of Alex and Vastum were like, I feel like the two that kind of started crusty death metal resurgence in the Bay Area. I don't know, Luca, you might disagree, but... No, no, I, 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 I don't know because it's like when I came to the States in 2008, I immediately started playing with Ace of Alex after like two weeks. Yeah. So it's like, I, I don't really know what was happening before. Like, you know, when I got here, I, I, I caught the tail end of Asunder. I caught the kind of like the tail end of Stormcrow. Or like, you know, the, the bands that were popular when I moved, 
Dean, they were like, uh, when I moved here, it was like Thorn Crow, kind of popular, you know, in the underground, or Laudanum, these bands, Ludicra, but then they all, they all quit, not that yeah. long after, and, and they are not really like, we're not talking about death metal bands. I mean, they're talking about metal bands, sure, but like Laudanum is not a death metal band, or, 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 or even Ludicra is a death metal band. So it's like, yeah, there was some crusty metal shit going on, but like, full on death metal. God damn it, I, I don't know. I'd have to think about it more. I don't know. Because we would yeah. go up to Portland, and I remember we would play with like Bone Sickness at the time a lot. We would play with Anidonist. There was like tons of bands in the Pacific Northwest that, that they were doing more death metal stuff, for sure.
Necrot album is called Mortal, and it's set to be released on August 28th. Tell people what the best way to order this album is. The best way to support Necrot directly is just buy any any sort of merch or an album off of our Bandcamp. And the, the link to that is necrot.bandcamp.com. Or you can purchase through Tank Crimes directly through them at tankcrimes.merchtable.com. But yeah, pretty much like that's those are the best two ways to support us right now. You know, we we had five months almost of tours, or just you know, a, we had five months worth of shows just get canceled this year. So, and a lot of bands have gotten everything canceled as well. So this is you know. Any any sort of way to buy merch or support us. I know everyone is struggling right now, but that's that's ultimately the best way to support Necrot in this time. Do you want to tell people a little bit about the, the physical formats that you have and some of the special edition vinyl that Tank Crimes is putting out? We've been kind of releasing new variants as they sell out, so not really sure what the what the variant count is on the vinyl, but we have LPs, we have two different CDs. We have a Digipack CD and we have a Jewel Case CD. And then we have tapes available for for Mortal. So pretty much like whatever format you enjoy listening to the most, there's a there's a format for it for the new album. Are copies of the splattered vinyl still available? A certain type of splatters I think is available maybe through Tank Crimes. We have like a, a red LP. We have a a limited like kind of a, yeah, it's like a purple, bone white, black merge, um, and then we have you know classic black vinyl, which is probably going to sound the best, <laughs> but nobody wants it because it's not a wacky color. <laughs> well, I think the truth is everyone who buys vinyl listens to music on their phone, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> and so they, put the, they, put the, they put the vinyl in the dishwasher and that's it <laughs> yeah <laughs> keep the cover yeah. <laughs> and if, if people want to follow Necrot how can they do that we have Twitter Instagram and Facebook the Twitter I think is just Necrot underscore official same with Instagram and then our Facebook address is facebook.com slash cycles of pain I think those are, yeah, I think that's all we got right now. And then if you want to follow us on social media, if you look hard enough, you can you can find our profiles tagged on, on probably Instagram is probably the best way. Do you want to give some updates for your other bands? Like what's going on with Vastum, Mortuous, Ace of Felix? Um, Mortuous is currently writing a new album, or I mean, it it is written. I'm just learning it at home when, when I can. So we're we're in the process of writing our second full length album. We're probably gonna record it at the end of this year, maybe early next year. It just really all depends on when the pandemic ends. And as far as Vastem, uh, we had a tour get canceled. That was that later. It was uh, like supposed to happen a week after the pandemic started. So you know we we were trying to support our our newest album, Or Official Purge, without mini tour, but yeah, I mean, as far as anything with Vastum goes, we're just kind of laying low. Everybody's trying to stay safe, and yeah. I think someone in Phoenix is, is writing some songs, maybe, <laughs> possibly. It's true. It, yeah, it, 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 like was, it was happening. And, maybe a Colin and Adam. Yeah, Colin and Adam, I feel like, are writing stuff. <laughs> what about Carbonized? What's what's going on with the label? <laughs> follow. <laughs> follow. Follow. Um, with Carbonized, I, I've been repressing a couple albums. I just put out a repress of the Mortuous LP, which, which came out two years ago. That was the first release I did in 2018. So that just saw a repress because Mortuous was supposed to do a European tour in April. got canceled, unfortunately, so we have copies of that. I just released a repress for another band called Funeral Leech from New York City. They're a kind of like a, a death a traditional death doom band and they're really really sick the album's awesome so um the the repress just came out i'm working on a couple new albums that i can't really talk about yet just because they're not announced but yeah i'm definitely trying to keep it going as as best i can amid you know amid the pandemic 
it's cool because a lot of people are at home right now, and so they're paying attention to their phones and and they're you know they're listening to the roster band. So I've been I've been moving a lot of records, which is cool, and I hope that continues to keep up. But you know, times are very uncertain, and I'm not holding my breath for anything. <laughs> <laughs> Carbonate. Subscribe. Subscribe. Like. Like. Like us on like us on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything else you guys want to say carbonite uh, thank, thank, <laughs> thank you for having us on, on the podcast it's, we really appreciate the support and the time that you're taking to, to hold the interview spot for us we, you know, we really appreciate it cool thank you so much guys